Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. So pleased to be here with you this evening and really looking forward to tonight's event. We're going to have a discussion about ice fishing with a great group of people who are quite knowledgeable about the subject. And then we're going to open it up for a Q&A with all of you, some of whom I believe also know a thing or two about ice fishing. This event tonight is part of a deep dive we've been doing into ice fishing this winter. That includes not one, but two photography exhibits currently on view at the museum. One is called Ice Shanties, Fishing, People, and Culture. And the other is Ice Visions by Eric Hoffner. And in connection with those two exhibits, we've organized a number of events. A few weeks ago, the photographer and ethnographer responsible for the Ice Shanties exhibit gave a talk about their work. Last week, Eric Hoffner gave a presentation on visual storytelling. A few weeks ago, we also had a local sculptor and art teacher, Ross Smart, lead an online workshop for kids on how to make mini ice shanties out of recycled materials. And starting this past weekend and continuing for the next two weeks, we have an outdoor display of whimsical, artful ice shanties on view at Brattleboro's Retreat Farm, just across from Retreat Meadows, where the real ice shanties are. This has been a little bit of a departure from what we generally do as a contemporary art museum, but it's been really great. We've been learning so much and connecting with all sorts of people we hadn't met before, including tonight's panelists. So in just a moment, I'm going to bring those panelists on the screen and we're going to talk ice fishing for, I don't know, 30 or 40 minutes. And then, as I mentioned, we'll do a Q&A. If there are questions or comments that occur to you during the, the panel discussion and you're here via Zoom, please use the Q&A button on your screen and you can type in your question so you don't forget it. Uh, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can just type your questions or comments in there and, and we'll keep an eye on that too. The other way you can participate in the Q&A is to wait until it's actually happening after the panel discussion and then use the raise hand button on your screen. That will signal me to unmute you and you can then ask your question yourself rather than typing it in. All right, with all that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to ask our panelists to turn on their cameras and mics now and join me here on screen. And while they're doing that, I'll tell you just a bit about who they are, but only briefly because they're gonna say more about themselves in just a moment. There they all are, so far so good. So first, uh, Paige Blaker is a fish production supervisor for Vermont Fish and Wildlife. She's joining us from her home in the opposite corner of the state up in Grand Isle. Rich Holshue is from right here in Brattleboro. Rich has served on the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. He's a public liaison for the El New Abenaki Indigenous Community, and he's the founder and director of the Atoli Project. Roy Gangloff is an ice fisherman here in Southern Vermont, descended from a long line of ice fishermen, Roy says he's been fishing for as long as he can remember, and ice fishing is a very important part of who he is as a person. And finally, Clay Groves, who joins us from Conway, New Hampshire, is a New Hampshire fishing guide and the host of the highly entertaining podcast, Fish Nerds. Thank you, Paige, Roy, Rich, Clay, for being here. Um, it's great to have you and looking forward to this conversation. So um, to get things started, I thought maybe we could just go around and each of you could just briefly tell us a little bit about your background and your involvement in ice fishing. Maybe, maybe give us an idea of what you love about it, if you do. Clay, why don't we start with you? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Clay, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide here up in New Hampshire. I've been ice fishing about oh, 25 years. My very first time ice fishing, I was driving around Squam Lake. And I saw a guy out there fishing on a bucket and I bought a six pack of beer and I walked out to him and put the beer down next to him. I said, can you show me how to do that? And he didn't say a word to me, just cracked the beer open, drank it, hand me his rod. And I thought this is the best thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And I've been addicted 
ever since. Uh, I've since become a podcaster. I've been on a quest to catch and eat every kind of fish in New Hampshire. And now I run a fishing guide service and I bring a lot of noobs, new, new ice fishers out on the ice to catch fish for the first time and hopefully get a lot of people hooked on it. It's a lot of fun. And I love the nerdiness of it, the modern ice fishing, the using the high tech electronics, mapping the lake bottoms. I love catching all kinds of species of fish, like a variety. So I'm, I'm all in. I love it. It's so much fun. Cool. Thank you, Clay. Paige, how about you? What's your connection with ice fishing? Well, I guess um, working in the fisheries career path, uh, I worked with Alaska for three years and then moved to Wyoming and worked with a variety of trout species. Uh, and now I'm here as the fish production supervisor, at the fish culture station up in Grand Isle, uh, where we have a variety of uh, trout species as well as Atlantic salmon that we're raising. Um, and ice fishing for me really kind of started in college. I didn't do much as a kid. It doesn't really run in the family, if you would, but um, kind of a similar experience to Clay, you know, someone pulled out the Dr. McGillicuddy's and I was like, you know what, this might be okay. And, uh, you know, I just, just being out in the open lakes on, you know, sunny days, bluebird days, just, you know, not a cure in the world, but whether your tip up is up or down. So, uh, I guess I just love ice fishing. I like all the different types of uh, fish that you can catch and, you know, the opportunities uh, that it affords a lot of different people. So to get out there and do stuff they love. Cool. Thank you, Paige. Rich, how about you? Will you want me, Danny? Kwai, Mziwi, Awani, and Delawizi, Litz, and Dai, Wantastagak, Utsisokwakik. My name is Rich, and I do live here in Brattleboro. Um, it's good to see you all tonight. And uh, as Danny said, I work as a liaison for the Elnu Abenaki tribe here in southern Vermont. I have served on the State Commission for Native American Affairs, and uh, I am director of Atui Project, which is a cultural outreach and educational nonprofit associated with Retreat Farm directly across from the aforementioned meadows where the shanties are. So um, we're here right at ground zero. And um, my experience with ice fishing, um, I'm a relative newbie at this point in my life. I fished when I was younger and I'm just coming back into that now. And I approach that through, um, through a lens of wanting to understand traditional sustenance practices. So I'm going to be engaged in the next couple of seasons with some, what you might call experimental archeology span or living history, trying to recreate some of those methods. And um, we'll see if we can talk about some of those tonight, but I'm going to mostly defer to the acknowledged experts in the virtual room. But thank you, Wuli Wuni. Thank you, Rich. Thanks for being here and part of the conversation. Roy, how about you? What, tell us about your connection with ice fishing. Well, I, I come from a long line of ice fishing, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very well connected uh, spiritually. Uh, it's all through our family. Uh, it's an important part of, 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 of who I am. Um, my grandfather was an ice fisherman. My dad was an ice fisherman. I'm an ice fisherman. My kids dabble in a little bit. They're a little bit too busy these days doing other things, but uh, they're, they, know how to, they know how to fish. And um, it dates way back. Um, when we started ice fishing, it was uh, it was important because uh, we had a family of eight. We had to feed people. And uh, those uh, weekend trips put food on the table. Uh, that, was, that was a big part of what we did. But at the same time, it was probably the most fun thing we did as kids, uh, at least in the wintertime. And uh, we got some very fond memories of fishing with my dad and his friends, and unfortunately, most of them are gone. So uh, I use ice fishing as a connection between them. Uh, there, there's a lot more to the sport than, uh, than just the catching, for sure. Can you say a little bit more about that, Roy? I see uh, Clay nodding in agreement. Start, uh, Danny. Uh, what would you like me to elaborate on? The, uh, you said it, there's a lot more to the sport than just catching. Oh, heck yeah. I mean, uh, I was, 
referring directly, you know, to the connection that I have with people that, that aren't with us anymore. Um, but um, it's a great way to unwind. Um, it's pretty good exercise at times when you've got a foot of snow out on the ice and you got to cut through another foot of ice to get to the water. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're like me, you're pretty mobile. You move around a lot. Uh, you get a lot of fresh air. It's a great stress reliever. And uh, it, it, it helps the, the winter, which is really important up here in Vermont. So I kind of, when I, when I meet people who don't ice fish or do anything in the winter, they just kind of stay indoors. I just wonder why the heck they're here. <laughs> I'd be somewhere. <laughs> Great. Thank, thank you, Roy. Thank you, all of you. Um, I'm excited that we have a group that has a, some overlap, but also some really different exper differing experiences and, uh, and perspectives and, and connections to ice fishing. So that's gonna make for a really interesting conversation. So for those of us who aren't familiar really with just like the nuts and bolts of ice fishing, uh, I was hoping that you guys can give us some of the basics, like when is the season and how does it work with licenses? And like, are you out there every day? and uh, are, are all waterways open to ice fishing and what fish do you catch? Paige, do you, maybe you can just start filling in some of the blanks for us, just kind of give some general background for those of us who really aren't familiar with the scene. And then uh, Clay, Rich, Roy, if you'd like to elaborate, please do. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not any game warden of any sort. So, uh, you know, like, you know, Vermont itself is actually trying to, uh, you know, simplify the regulations. So, you know, make sure that you're not making assumptions every year on regulations and you're actually looking through the book because they do change on a regularly, uh, a yearly basis even. And, you know, for the people on here that aren't from Vermont and are in different states, it's also very important to recognize that each state has different regulations for different species and different waterways. Um, so, you know, there's not every waterway is open know the different spawning seasons and so we protect those seasons uh so you know, in general uh depending on when the ice is made you can assume that ice fishing season will be somewhere between december and, and you know march april if you're lucky depending on uh where you live uh but so those are kind of some of the basics you need to keep your eyes out for is um always know uh the type of bait fish you're allowed to use, or if there's no bait fish at all, um, knowing what species you're going to be targeting and making sure you're, you know how much you can catch and how big of size of the catch do, because that will also change from pond to pond uh, or different waterways. Um, so just a lot of different intricacies that you can all find in the fishing regulations books that are updated and released on a yearly basis. Cool. Thank you. Anybody want to add anything to that? Kind of flesh out the picture for us. Like if you're if you're really into ice fishing, are you out there every night? Every every how, what does that scene look like, Clay? Well, so so for me, there there are I love ice fishing more than open water fishing. I love the the specificness, the targeting of a spot. You're in a spot. You're not drifting away. It's very very specific and tight, which is really great about it. And one of the things you asked about what kind of fish you catch. Every kind of fish that you catch in the summertime, you can catch in the winter through the ice, except for one. There's one fish that pretty much you only get in the wintertime because in the summer they do what's called estivation, which is almost like a hibernation, and that would be the burbot or the cusk. Mm -hmm. And those guys almost hibernate in the summertime. In the winter, they come alive, and you can get them in the big, deep glacial lakes, and they eat like crazy and have giant orgies under the ice, and that's when you catch them, and they're so much fun. They're nocturnal. And that's a fish that they're, they're a freshwater cod fish, the only freshwater cod fish in the world. Uh, and they're, they're so much fun. There's like 37 names for them. Burbot, Cusk, Lawyer, Ling Cod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, they look like if a, if a catfish and an eel had a love child. <laughs> the fish, And they're beautiful and I love them so much. And that's kind of a really kind of a fun thing. And you catch those at nighttime. You can jig them up. And in New Hampshire, you can set overnight traps for them. Um, Paige, though, nailed something, though about knowing your regulations. You don't have to know all the regulations. Just know the body of water you're fishing on that day. 
So when you get your book, don't worry mm-hmm. about all the rules. Worry about the rules that you need today where you're fishing. That's kind of the most important thing. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're, am, am I right in assuming that you, there are a lot of people who are doing ice fishing who are not, you, they don't have ice shanties, right? True. Is that right? I didn't have a shanty for the longest um, time, honest with you, because I would go so many different places. And I wasn't going to tow my ice shanty with me. Once I became yeah. a little more, I put a shanty down on the retreat and I've had one there for probably 30 years. Uh-huh. And so, um, Roy, when you, when you set up a shanty, say on the retreat meadows or wherever you might do that, um, obviously you have to then be keeping an eye on the ice conditions because you might have to pull it off. Mm-hmm. Do you, like, how, how often do you have to do that? Uh, we've only probably had to remove it prematurely a handful of times. Um, but what you really have to do during the course of the ice season is you don't want your ice shanty to settle into the ice. Uh, you know, it will, it will just kind of keep sinking and sinking and sinking. Uh, so I see. locking it up and then eventually those blocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point you'll have to, you probably want to move it because the, your drip edges and things like that, you're going to kind of, you know, cut the little holes all around your ice shanty. And uh, we've had a few accidents down there over the years with people, <laughs> they, they weren't taking care of their stuff. And um, I won't, I won't mention anybody's name in case he's listening, but this person was pretty well known for <laughs> being careless in that regard. And, and uh, his went through one morning, I saw it on the way to work. Uh, he was Ooh. able to uh, salvage it, but uh, it was quite an ordeal. Roy, have you ever lost your shack? Oh, no. No, I'm <laughs> very... <laughs> Swimming in the highly overrated. So. Okay, well, uh, so last year, Roy, I lost my shack for the first time. I didn't pay attention. It sank. Do you guys want to see a picture of, a, of my shack halfway through the ice? Put it up. Danny, can I share a screen here? I think you can. I think you can. All right. Yeah. I'm gonna get the... Are you set up? To, does it let you? Uh-huh. I'm on it. So okay. you should be able to see my ice shack last year, my nightmare. Can you guys see that? Oh. Boy. <laughs> yeah, I can see it, Clay. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, and I, yeah. And I, I'm a, I guide out of that shack. I had to have it rescued. So we put it out there and we had great ice and then the heat came and I went away for a week and I came back and the, the shack had absorbed all the heat and had sank two thirds through the ice. And that was my nightmare right there. I had to pay someone to come out with winches and cranes and drag it up on the mm-hmm. ice. And um, it's, it, it's, it, we fished out of the rest of the year, still, you know, still worked, but it was, uh, it was gross. It's, it's such a terrible, wow. <laughs> I, I get anxiety still looking at that photo. <laughs> well, you're really owning it though. You have it at the ready to share and uh, I, yeah. I respect that. <laughs> um thanks clay if you want to if you unshare your screen uh, there there we go thank you um rich what do we yeah rich you, you wanted to chime in and i had a question for you but please go ahead i'm going to back up one question and i'm going to ask if Paige yeah. or someone else can uh elaborate for the audience as to why there are so many different regulations for every different body of water <laughs> that's Put you on the spot page. That's a good question. Um, There's so many regulations because each waterway is so different and so unique. And so just like Clay mentioned that you need to know specific, the unique regulations for for that day, it's because it's a unique body of water. No body of water is the same. You don't have the same predator species. You don't have the same native species living in there. And so different species all interact in different ways. Uh, So, you know, if you have a big population of muskies that are eating, you know, trout eggs and stuff, there's probably a a good chance that that's going to be a trophy muskie lake and not necessarily a a trophy brook trout lake. Uh, They're just so different because there's so many different interactions and each waterway is different as well. Something that's big and open like Lake Champlain, where you can get a lot more bigger fish because that's how it's managed. Whereas, you know, you might have a smaller pond up up north and the only thing that it's managed for is trophy brown trout. 
Um, so obviously if the, they manage for bigger size, you're going to be allowed to, to, you know, keep bigger fish essentially. Um, so it really depends on specific areas that you're in as well as specifically what is the goal and what is the management strategy of that body of water that the regional biologists have decided on. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. For, thanks for that question, Rich. I'm, I'm curious to know from each of your perspectives, um, over the course of time that you've been involved with ice fishing, is the community changing? Is the culture around ice fishing changing? And if so, what does that look like? Um, Roy, maybe we can start with you uh, sure. with that question. Well, the, the community has definitely changed, gotten a lot bigger. Um, ice fishing is, is probably, in fact, it's definitely more popular now than it, than it ever has. Uh, when I came here in 1981, on any given Sunday, if you went down there to Retreat Meadows and counted how many people were out there, you passed three or four. And uh, if the weather was bad, it was only one. And, and I'm on a Zoom meeting right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it's really changed. And it's changed. For the art, art museum, no less. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, the community's definitely gotten bigger, and it's good to see. It's, it's good to see more people out enjoying uh, the activity. Also, there's been a lot of nice things that I've been involved with uh, as far as meeting people. Um, I've had lots of, uh, lots of friends that I've made over the years from people that I never would have met otherwise. Uh, a gentleman uh, contacted me one time from Maryland, actually right around the Washington, D.C. area, to be specific. And he called me and he told me his name. And I'm like, Geez, I, I don't know this guy. And he started talking how he had a teenage son who was a little bit troubled, yada, yada, yada. And uh, he was looking for someone to take his son ice fishing. And he said he stopped at Sam's Army Navy Department store and asked a few questions, you know, about who might be able to help him. And Sam's gave him my name. Then he went to a bait shop and he asked the bait shop guy a few questions and asked again, you know, who, who he might contact. And the bait shop gave him my name. And then when he got into town, he asked uh, a friend of his if he knew anybody here that, that ice fished. And he says, well, I hear about this gangloff guy. He, Elliot said, well, I said, I, I guess three for three. He says, that should be the person I talked to. <laughs> and uh, we had, we, it was, it was, a, it was very nice getting to, to know him uh, and helping his son, mentoring him. Um, so, yeah. Uh, nice. Yeah. 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 Very nice. Clay, how about you? How, what's your perspective on the, the community, the culture, the, uh, well, the scene there's, around ice fishing so and how two, it's changed. There's, there's two sides to it, right? So there's the there's the 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 building community. There's so many Facebook groups and different organizations that get together and talk about ice fishing. But then there's the other side where everyone's really afraid of of uh, site burning and that sort of thing. They they don't want to give up the secret spots. So they share pictures um, of of ice fishing where they hide the background and all as you can see is. You know, you might you might not be able to see where they caught the fish. I just shared a screen picture of one of my sight burning free pictures there on the screen. You see a giant trophy brook trout, and I hid that because I'm on Hoth fishing for that fish. So, you know, that's that's a big change for the culture there. Um, but it's it's fun, and and I think it really brings people together. And I think that more people are fishing now than ever before because of that community that's built on the internet and with things like these Zoom meetings and stuff like that. And I think it's great. I think the more people we get outside playing, the better. Um, I think Roy said it earlier that people who play in the winter have a better winter and got to get them out and enjoying it. So we always encourage people to, to, to jump in, not jump in. I assume, I, I assume a, a podcast that has to do with ice fishing is a relatively new development. Uh, it, it, I guess well, it must be, you know, I've, I've been doing it for almost yeah. 10 years now, uh, but there's a whole oh, bunch, and, and there are podcasts dedicated just to ice fishing. That's very niche. I talk about, uh, you know, biology. I see. You, yeah, and fishing in general. Too. Yeah. Um, of course. Is it, is, it, is it true that in New Hampshire you call ice shanties bob houses? I, I call mine that when it's floating in the water. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, Roy? I didn't, I didn't hear you. 
started, come to think of it, the house bobbing around in the water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Rich, also, uh, Rich. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Roy. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Talking over you. Uh, there, there's also a term that they use uh, in New Hampshire when they were smell fishing. They would call it bobbing for smell. Mm -hmm. So uh, to mm -hmm. the Bob House uh, name came from, from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rich. Is there, I'm curious, uh, is there, a, is there a, um, an Abenaki tradition of ice fishing? Is it, um, is that something that you know, or that we know, or that you're looking into, or maybe learning about? And um, is that something that is strictly in the past, or is it still uh, vibrant today? Um, what, can you tell us anything about that? Sure, I'd be happy to share what I know so far. This is a subject that I'm I'm in the process of researching. Um, as far as the contemporary Beneke community, uh, ice fishing is a popular thing to do, especially up on the lake. Uh, the community at Missisquoi is very much into that. Um, Swanton, Missisquoi River Basin, um, ice fishing is. Uh, I you know I guess there's a lot of widows up there. Now the women are out there too. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's a really big deal, and uh, and and down here as well, but but less of a, a concentration of folks in the community. Uh, traditionally, um, ice fishing has been practiced here for thousands of years, and um, that's kind of a fun fun idea to wrap your head around. Is uh, who was here then, and uh, how did they go about it, and um, where where you know, what were their practices? How were they going about this? Uh, for example, uh, we go out on, on the meadows at the retreat now uh, across from the farm and go fishing as Roy's, Roy's speaking about, but um, put yourself back 120 years and you weren't doing that because there was no retreat meadows with water <laughs> on it. It was dry land. It was a meadow. Yeah, it was a meadow. It's an actual meadow. In fact, yeah. yeah. the name, yeah. Right. And, but um, so, Rich, can, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just explain for those who aren't familiar with the um, with the geography there, uh, uh, the geology there in, in Brattleboro, why we have this body of water that is a permanent body of water now, but we call it retreat meadows? Uh, so we for sure. Um, we have a, a, a backwater, a setback here on the West River. Um, just upstream of the confluence with the Connecticut uh, that was called the Meadows. Uh, it was a big alluvial plain with very rich soil, agricultural land uh, that was farmed for hundreds, uh, well, a thousand years. Let's, let's look at the, the real facts. And, um, and, and that name as Meadows stuck. And then the retreat, the Brattleboro retreat, which still exists, uh, acquired that property. Uh, early on in its history, and it became known as the Retreat Meadows. And then in 1909, uh, 10 miles downstream at Vernon on the Connecticut River main stem, the Vernon Dam was built, the first hydroelectric dam on the Connecticut main stem. And that backed the water up upstream for 27 miles, all the way to Westminster. And it had the effect of flooding what were meadows and becoming a very shallow uh, setback, and it's the name stuck. So we call it Retreat Meadows, yeah. even though uh, you can't walk on it unless you have special powers, or it's winter time, right? So uh, you know we can all walk on water. But I just to just to cover that subject really quickly. Traditionally, ice yeah. fishing around here was uh, is more of a hunting endeavor. Um, we're, we're not dealing with tip ups and we're not dealing with, with, uh, fishing poles with lures on them per se, because the technology for hooks didn't really exist. So the, the, what the practice was, is that you would hack, hack a hole in the ice. Um, you did not have an auger, <laughs> whether it was gasoline or, or, uh, or hand auger, you were using a, a chisel, basically, uh, some kind of a sharp instrument, hafted instrument, you'd open up a hole. And then um, the practice was to build a little tiny hut over it, like a little tent, a little tiny wigwam. And that had the effect of um, cutting down on the glare 
so that you could see down into the water and you would physically lay down on the ice and jig in the water with a little jig, um, which you might, might make to look like a little fish. Um, I'm working on an idea here. See this here? Mm -hmm. This is a fresh freshwater mussel shell. And they would, they would be cut into um, a little lure and dangled on a piece of cordage in the water to attract the fish, just the, uh, the sight, the movement. And the, the uh, fishermen would wait with a spear. And you had to spear the fish through the ice. That was the traditional fishing practices here. And those were shared with most Northeastern woodland cultures. Um, it sounds cold. <laughs> It sounds um, like an exercise in extreme patience, but then again, the fish populations were probably somewhat different than they are now. So maybe, maybe one could, you know, successfully do that. Can do that. Yeah. Cool. It, it'll be really fascinating as I know this is, I know you're in the process of learning more about this and with the intention of teaching the rest of us. And that's going to be really fascinating to learn more about that. Thanks for sharing what the beginnings of, of what you know. You know what's um, interesting? Roy, I, uh, oh, I, hang on one second, Clay. Roy, I just want to let Roy know. Roy, you, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew you turned off your video. If you did it on purpose, that's fine. I just uh, wanted to make sure you knew. I have uh, Clay, what were you going to say? Well, this is for Rich. So, Rich, that, your description of, of how, uh, how the uh, Abenaki um, – with spear fishing it sounds very much like modern spear fishing. They do that in the Midwest. So they build shacks, they dangle a lure in, they lay on their bellies, and and then when the fish come in, they, they spear them. I don't think it's changed that much for spear fishing in a spear shack. I think it's pretty much the same tech that's been around for eons. Well, that's great. I was not aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. Do any of you? Um... Do any of you see climate change having an impact on ice fishing? And um, if so, what does that look like? Uh, anyone who cares to jump in on that, please do. Well, to me, it's very worrisome. Uh, I mean, not so far south of here, uh, ice seasons have become, you know, a, a coin toss 50-50, whether they get safe ice to fish or not. Uh, there's a group of guys I know that live down in Westfield, Mass. and. Uh, you know, for the last 10 years or so, they've been coming up here because often they don't have enough safe ice down there to fish on. Um, possibly in the Berkshires down there, they're okay. But, you know, in the river valley down that way, the, the ice can be pretty sketchy. And if you go even farther south, uh, people I know down in Connecticut, they don't even expect to get safe ice anymore on the bigger lakes like Candlewood and Lillanona and places like that. All right. Yeah. So it's kind of frightening. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Paige, it looked like you were going to chime in as well. Yeah, and I agree with Roy. You know, um, climate change is definitely making for shorter fishing seas. This year, too, people are putting their boats in at the end of March. It, it, it's crazy, but, you know, with that being said, you know, people who really enjoy ice fishing and want to get out there, like, don't be discouraged with with the cold. Uh, is anyone else having trouble hearing Paige? For me, her, her feed is freezing now and then. Paige, we're losing some of what you're saying. Um, it's uh, pretty sorry. windy yeah. up here. Uh, so yeah. my... It, my so internet's, internet's going in and out. In and out. Um, I understand. But it, to, it might, yeah, it, it might be helpful if you turn off your video, we can at least hear you speaking that and that might take up less bandwidth. Do you want to just give that a shot while you're, while you're responding to this question? Sure, I can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. So the climate change, you know, is making for shorter seasons, especially on the big lakes. Uh, but it looking to what else you can do if you're looking to to continue to ice fish you don't be afraid to look to those smaller ponds and in different areas those smaller ponds are going to give you some different um 
ice fishing opportunities, you know, that might even last into April, maybe May, especially if you get up into a little bit higher elevations or, you know, places in the Northeast Kingdom that are staying a little bit colder for a little bit longer. Um, you know, those are the type of opportunities that ice fishermen kind of need to start looking for. Um, unfortunately, climate change is changing the way that it's not changing how we ice fish, but it is changing when and where we ice fish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Clay? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to kind of follow with what Paige said. And a really important thing that I've noticed up here, and I live in the mountains in New Hampshire, um, we have ice that normally is safe for years and years and years. And then the last couple of years, we've lost ice fishers because ice that they've fished their whole life has changed. And so it's really important that people take safety very, very seriously. And I think we find me, we should probably talk about ice safety at some point during this discussion tonight, uh, because, well, because yeah. with climate change or whether it's weather or climate, I, I, it's hard to tell when you're in it, whether it's climate change or just weather being weird one year. Um, it's really important that we make sure that everyone who goes on the ice is doing it in a safe way. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we will get to that question of safety in, in just a minute, uh, which someone has, has already asked us to, to talk about it a bit. Um, did anyone else want to say anything about climate change and your perceptions of how that's uh, affecting ice fishing? So listening to you all speak um, on that question, but, but sort of everything that you've been saying so far, it feels to me that um, there's kind of a conservation ethic uh, associated with, with ice fishing. And, that, um, and I'm curious about whether current ideas and approaches to environmental conservation and environmentalism, are those in sync with with ice fishing or, or are there tensions there? How does, what does that look like? Well, I, I see some tension. <laughs> I'll, I better mind, yeah. I'll just jump right in. Uh, so like, like I'm a big anti-lead fisher. Like I don't believe people should be fishing with lead anymore. We know lead's bad. It's bad for the environment. It's bad for the watershed. It kills loons. So New Hampshire, for example, has outlawed, outlawed lead sinkers and small lead jigs. And other states have made rules to like, say if you like Maine, for example, if you paint your lead, it's okay to fish with lead in Maine. I don't know Vermont rules, but I think that everyone mm -hmm. just as conservation ethics should just stop fishing with things that we know is bad for the environment. Um, the argument that old school fishers say is things like bismuth and tin and tungsten cost too much. But at the same time, I've never met an ice fisher person who hates buying fishing gear. So I think it's a poor excuse. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with so that's the tension I see. People are just hold on to their old ideals or they want to, they want to pull a gas auger instead of using electric. They just, they love the old stuff that kind of sucks. <laughs> so. That's not, that's not great for the environment. Interesting. Anyone else want to have thoughts about this? Want to weigh in on this? Uh, I, I, fishermen are, are very conservative uh, you know, as far as that, what, what they take out of the, what, out of the water. I mean, obviously, we don't put things anything back in, um, but we don't keep everything we catch. Um, there's there's terminology that you, you often hear as selective harvest. Uh, that's you know allowing people to, to to take fish, but to be careful of what they take. You don't want to take the biggest and the best, the fish that produce the best. Um, you want to take fish out of the population that's part of the larger part of the population. You know, like a, for instance, a, a, a ten inch bluegill is a big bluegill and uh, they're, they're kind of rare, but boy, there's a ton of eight inches. So those are the ones that you want to take home. Um, there, there's plenty of them and they, they replenish themselves. So uh, that's, that's kind of how uh, we look at conservation. Thank you for that. Are, is it fair to say that most uh, ice fishers are, um, what, they, what they keep, they're gonna they're eating no not not in new hampshire um in new hampshire and it's like kind of my big pet peeve there's a lot of fishers who think some fish are junk fish and they like they'll catch a bunch of yellow perch and toss them on the ice or they'll catch uh pickerel and toss them on the ice thinking they're helping out something or doing something good for the environment um it's very i don't know about, about vermont but new hampshire it's my big like 
I get angry about it because I don't, if you're going to keep fish, great. You're going to eat it. Wonderful. You're killing a fish for the sake of killing it. I'm not in. It's not legal either, by the way, but people do it all over the place. Hmm. Piggyback on that one. Oh. Yeah, Paige, please go ahead. Oh, well, I just was. Changes that for me, you know, I went to school in Maine and watching people toss. It must, it, must, it must be getting some real wind up there in Grand Isle because Paige keeps cutting in and out for me. I don't know if that's, is that happening for the rest of you as well? Yeah. Oh, this is a bummer, Paige. I really wanted to hear what you have to say. I'm going to go to Roy, who was also going to respond. And then Paige, let's try again and see if we can, we can hear you. But Roy, you were going to say something about that whole thing with the junk fish. And... Yeah, I mean, that's... There are people who do that, uh, and it, it is illegal to do that. It's called wanton waste of wildlife. Um, our game wardens can't be out there all the time, and I have no problem myself taking that little bit of responsibility on it, pointing it out to somebody they shouldn't be doing that. If it's done in the mm -hmm. proper way, it's, all you're going to do is educate someone. And yeah. if, it, uh, if it gets ugly... I can take care of myself. Uh, I know Mr. Hathaway, who was a former game warden, is is uh, is on this watching this podcast, um, and um, I, I, I hope he would agree with me because uh, I've had to do that many times, uh, and it's it's gone well almost every time. Mm -hmm. Do you find that usually when you have to say something that it's somebody who um, just you, you know they didn't they they didn't have a clue before that. Like you're, you're educating them and they're open to it. Most times, most times, most sometimes times, yeah. kind of bad. There's been a few instances where, you know, it got, uh, got into an argument. Um, but mm -hmm. when I know what I'm talking about, I usually don't always lose arguments. <laughs> You'd be persuasive. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can hear Paige again. Um, Paige wanted to, try to respond uh sure can you hear me <laughs> we can yeah for the moment yeah sorry about this Nah, it's you know i guess yeah. living in grand isle so um i'm trying to get my thoughts together a little bit i think i was talking trash bin down the I Paige, it's not really working out. I'm sorry to say. Um, if you if you want to type anything into the chat, uh, um, anything that you want to add, I'll see it there and I can I can convey it. But I think we're just having too much trouble with your internet connection right now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, so um, one of the questions that has already come in or suggestions is that we um, touch on ice safety. And I, I um, was thinking that that was a topic that we ought to address and, and maybe as part of a broader topic that, um, which is, you know, we might have some people in the audience here tonight, uh, or, you know, I'm speaking for myself and Rich has acknowledged that he's a newbie getting back into ice fishing. Um, from a safety standpoint, but also just from a broader standpoint, what what kinds of it, what advice do you have for someone who just wants to get into ice fishing um, for the first time? How how would I go about that? And let's make sure to address some safety issues too. Um, you know how we can learn uh, about proper safety. So Clay or Roy, or maybe or both of you. I'll jump in because it's something that, that I take very seriously. I've seen so many, so many people who just, uh, they, they, don't, they don't respect uh, ice safety. Um, you know, for for uh, starters, four inches of good black ice is the base that you want before you venture out, um, especially down on the retreat meadows. There's culverts there. There's uh, water. In, there's water flowing out 
Uh, there's a lot of dying vegetation down there uh, underneath the ice that you know, is going to give off gases and whatnot, and it can form weak spots. Uh, before we had Eurasian milfoil down in, in that body of water, I was okay being on two and a half to three, but it had to be under good conditions too. It had to be under cold conditions where the ice was forming and not softening or melting in the very least. So that's why I say nowadays four. Uh, but you also have to still be conscious, like I said, about, you know, where water's moving. Um, and, and that goes for, for any body of water that you're on. Um, first ice, I always have a spud bar with me. Uh, the spud bar, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to give it a good wrap and see if I can stand on the ice at the shoreline. And if I can, I'm going to reach out one more length of my arm and give it another wrap and just kind of keep repeating the process. Until I get out to where I know there's maybe three or four feet of water, and then I'm going to cut a hole right through there. And with my hand, reach down in and measure the ice thickness and say, okay, there's three good solid inches, and I'll probably go another 20 or 30 feet. And I've always done that. My grandfather taught me how to do that. Um, how many times I've worked my way out there being as cautious as I can be. And a guy will come out with his two little kids one on each arm, walk out to where I'm fishing and ask me how thick the ice is. Well, that guy should know before he takes his kids out for himself, just how thick the ice is. And, and if the ice is in good condition, don't go walking out there and ask somebody, know for yourself. Great, that's a, that's a great start on safety issues. Clay, do you wanna add anything else about safety? about safety or just in general, how to get into the sport? Well, sure. Well, let me just, let me just kind of back up what Roy said real quick. Uh, there, we, we, I always tell clients, and if I'm doing seminars, there's no such thing as safe ice. That's a word we don't use. Your ice is always a movie. You're on a floating body of, your, your ice is floating. <laughs> so there's going to be some variability. And if you fall through, there's no one going to come get you. So you have to always make sure that you remember that when you're going into it and do everything Roy said. He nailed it on the money. I actually, on early ice, I wear a float suit. So if I fall through, I, I'm not going to get uh, underwater, which is for me. But I've also, before I even had that kind of equipment, I used to wear a uh, life jacket out on early ice when I'm testing ice and drag a rope all the way to shore just because it's a very serious thing. Um, and then for getting into it, uh, the best thing you could do, and I, I think I told the story at the beginning, is find someone who's into it. Find someone like Roy who loves it and go out with him. I, um, most most people love to talk about ice fishing. Ice fishermen are bored and they're lonely and they need you to come out and talk to them after you know the ice safe and learn to fish with them. Bring them snacks and beer and you've got it uh, nailed. Um, there are a lot of people who you can hire a guide like me. That's reasonable. I'll take your money. But most people would love to invite you fishing and ice fishers on the ice love to talk to people, especially if they're fishing with traps because they're waiting all day for fish. So go talk to people and ask them, can you show me how to do that? Most people will hand you a rod and teach you to fish right there and you'll have a blast. Talk to people, make friends. Fishers love to talk, especially if they can brag about some fish they caught. They're, they're all in. So talk to people. There's a thousand ways to ice fish, but talk to people. That's a big way. That's not really true on everybody in water, but we're very fortunate. The retreat <coughs> medical area is a nice community of people. Uh, we've had, I don't know how many dozens or maybe even hundreds of people walk out and ask us questions. Uh, we not only answer the questions, we also even let them fish. Mm -hmm. So if you approach somebody in the right manner with the right person, um, yeah, you, you, you can certainly do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talk to everybody on the ice when I'm out there, I walk up to different groups and chat them up and I just make friends like crazy. I get the, I don't know, Clay, you seem, you seem like a guy who's kind of, you know, wouldn't just walk up to somebody and start talking. I'm sure. <laughs> Paige, we got you back. It looks like you have a, a good connection there. Okay. I tried to swap to my phone. So hopefully that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Now you sound great. We got, we, we got you. Uh, we were just talking about um, safety issues and also um, how to get involved in the sport. Did, did, any thoughts on that that you want to share? Um, well, I may have may missed a little bit of the safety on the ice, um, but, you know, a reminder to people that just because it's black and clear doesn't mean it's 
you know, sometimes it can be scary for people, um, but that's actually some of the safest ice because you don't have the air bubbles in there. Um, so, you know, just because you can see all of that stuff uh, doesn't mean it's unsafe. Um, and, you know, sometimes it can be, um, obviously drill a hole, make sure you can actually figure out how much ice is there. It can be very deceiving sometimes. Um, uh, very much agree with having like the dry suit on, especially if you're going to a new area, especially if you're alone and you don't have a kind of a get out of jail card, but you know, with a plan. Um, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, for me, I, I got an ice fishing, uh, a group of people told me, I think you'll like this. And that's kind of how I got into ice fishing, but I would agree. I think ice, you know, fishing on open water, there's only so many people you can fit on a boat. Well, there's unlimited in general ice space. So, you know, you can have a group of, I've, I've ice fish with 20 people, it, you know, all sitting around their holes and it's really more of a social event and kind of like Clay said, go talk to people. That's all we're doing is, and you know, if we're lucky, we'll have a jig rod in our hand, but we're, we're there to talk and hang out and exchange fishing stories and tips and tricks of the trade and successes and failures. So definitely chatting people up is Thank you, Paige. Um, Rich, it sounds like uh, down here at Retreat Meadows, there's a community that might be open to newbies like us uh, learning how to get involved. Yeah, I'm, and I'm going to be looking up Roy. <laughs> <Just talk. laughs> um, so, uh, I want to I want to make sure to have time for audience uh, questions and uh, there's one in here uh, queued up already from Mr. Hathaway. Um, but before so before we do that, I just wanted to go around and see if any of you have any like anything we didn't touch on or a story you want to share or you know just something a message you want to make sure to get out there related to ice fishing before we. We, we just dive into audience questions. Something you wish I had asked that I didn't ask. Well, can I hit a couple quick points, Danny? Please uh, do. Yes, please. It's much easier uh, than people think to get started. Uh, you know, if you want to like do a Google search for simple ice fishing tactics, it's going to show you just how simple it really is. Um, you know, human beings, we make everything so more comp so much more complicated than it really needs to be. Kind of go over the top. Thing. And that's kind of like where we are with ice fishing right now. I mean, this guy's that have thousands of dollars worth of tackle. That's uh, me. Like doing different things. <laughs> and you can do the same thing and get the same effect for less than probably a couple hundred dollars to get started. A uh, hand auger, we're probably going to run you about $50. That's probably your most important tool because you got to get a hole through the ice. And uh, mm -hmm. anything be jury rigged or probably bought for another, you know, a, a good fishing pole and reel, less than $50. Uh, bait is cheap. A couple dollars a dozen for, for shiners, a couple dollars for, for grubs. Uh, lures are relatively inexpensive. Um, so don't, uh, don't, don't look at the uh, stuff. Just look at the beginning because it's very simple to get started. Um, I guess that's all I'll add in that regard, but uh, I want to back up just to one second more to ice safety. And another important thing we forgot to mention was uh, was having a throw device and a rope with you. Uh, you know, either a boat cushion or a life saving ring, um, and, and attached to a good, you know, sturdy piece of rope, maybe about fifty feet, just in case you ever do have to do an ice rescue. Uh, I've never had to do, it, but I always have my throw device with me. Maybe somebody will have to throw it to me someday. <laughs> <laughs> is there um, is there a resource for like safety tips? So you know we don't. So it's not just left to. Oh, I happen to be on the Zoom with Roy, and I took really and Paige, and you know, and took really good notes. Um, is there is there some place people can go uh, to educate themselves on on ice safety? 
it, it, most of the um, fishing regulation guides have ice safety right in the guides. Uh, most okay. states have that. I know New Hampshire, for example, does. I would assume Vermont does as well. I mean, nobody wants anyone to fall through the ice. So I think most states take it pretty seriously in their guides. Yeah. Great. And I realize for those of you who are so experienced in this, um, these, these aren't the most, um, you know, the most pertinent questions for you. I'm sorry, I bring, I'm bringing a total uh, outsider's newbie's perspective to it. And um, hopefully that is a, and yeah, hopefully that is a, a, of interest to at least some of you. Rich. Yeah, so here's a, here's a weird question. <laughs> Um, I'm going to toss this at my other three panelists. Um, I have not had experience with this yet, but I have heard that among the uh, Missisquoi community of a Beneke up on the lake, um, and probably with others, um, you're 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 catching a lot of perch. Perch are great fish; taste taste wonderful. And then you can use the perch for bait as well. And eyes are particularly coveted. And I have heard people speak proudly about how they like to keep the eyes underneath their tongue so they don't freeze. Any opinions on that? Trying to set you up, Rich. Everyone <laughs> does it. Yep. <laughs> okay. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> you asked the right crowd. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so we've got we've got a number of questions queued up here from people in the audience, and uh, I thank you all in the audience for for uh, for being patient and um, and I invite you at this time if you do have questions and you haven't already put them into the Q and A. Now a few of you have put your questions into the chat. That's all right. I'm going to get to those, but it's a little easier for me if you use the Q and A button instead. I can kind of keep track of it a little more easily. And again, as I mentioned earlier, if you do want to actually let your voice be heard, you can try the raise hand button and I'll, and I'll unmute you. But let's start with some of the questions we have here in the chat. So Dane Hathaway asks, has the number of fish you catch changed because of global warming? I, I can't say it's because of global warming, but the numbers of fish aren't, uh, aren't what they once were. Um, here and, and just about anywhere, but that's probably because there's just a lot more competition uh, for the fish. And uh, the fish probably are getting a little smarter than they used to be too. There's been a lot of catch and release over the years. And um, some of these fish may be conditioned to some of the techniques and tactics that we use. Um, I don't believe that there's danger, but it's maybe just not quite as good as it used to be, but it's still good. Great. Um, Dane also asks, has ice fishing changed because of the bait fish regs? Anyone? There else? Paige? Or, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Anyway. Well, actually, we don't have any much for regs in New Hampshire. That's more specific to Vermont. Um, is Paige still with us? Um, uh, yeah, I can hear her. She, she'd yeah. be it's Maybe. going out on me, but um, I what what's the question, uh, Roy? The question was: Has ice fishing changed because of bait fish regs? I'm not sure more specifically than that. Um, <laughs> well, that's kind of a. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends if if you can't use certain baits anymore. Um, you know, there, there's a, I really only fish Lake Champlain, so I can't speak to a lot of different places here in Vermont yet. Um, you know, I've only been here a year and a half, but I can tell you that, you know, certain species are going to be, you know, predatory fish are going to be more attracted to bait fish. And if you remove that regulation altogether and you can't use bait fish, um, you know, I, I don't know if global climate change is said reason for bait fish not working but as roy mentioned fish become attracted to different things over the last span so you know just genetic wise they sometimes are attracted to blue and sometimes attracted to red um, and that can change within the pop you know as the population grows and declines and, and that goes back to 
uh, has it affected how many fish we're catching, people have to remember that there used to be little to no regulations. So of course we're seeing less numbers of fish and just remember that, you know, the biologists and the hatcheries are working manage these systems as people are catching fish and as people are requesting more certain species and as of water body that we're going to have and that we're going to manage for. So the population is going to grow and decline um, based on the culture of ice fishing and what people like to catch. Thank you, Paige. Um, we have a comment here from Zachary McNaughton, who says, ZTFW, I, I assume that means Vermont Fish and Wildlife, ZTFW and I produced a virtual ice fishing clinic that includes an ice safety training video. Oh, great. That's great. Yeah, yeah that's thank you, Zachary. I'm glad Zach brought that up. Uh, Zach worked with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and they not only did the ice safety uh, thing he mentioned, but they also did a virtual ice fishing clinic. Uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife every year, except for this year because of the COVID, has sponsored a Learn to Fish Day on different bodies of water. So going forward, hopefully in 2022, uh, they'll start back up with those. And they kind of rotate around the state. Uh, they kind of hit each corner and then the middle. So about every fourth or fifth year, you probably have something down here. And um, they've been very popular. Uh, and if we can get a little more volunteer work, we might be able to do more than one per year. So uh, just uh, stay tuned with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife uh, website uh, in the future and see. It, it'll, it'll come around in the winter, obviously, the ice fishing uh, clinics. But uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or connect through Vermont Fish and Wildlife Facebook and all the information will be there. Great. Thank you. Uh, Peggy and Clint. Bissell or Bissell, not sure, uh, ask, what do fishermen do to control the spread of aquatic invasive species during the winter months? Can I answer that? Yeah, please. Not, not much. Uh, because we're not moving boats in and out of waters, we're not having, there's no bilge on our boat, on our, on our ice sleds. We're not moving water from one place to the other. So we're not really moving plants around um so there's there's less to I'm, I'm sure it's not impossible to move the plants around but it's there's really not as much a problem i think in the wintertime. i could be wrong if anyone thinks i'm wrong please tell me because i'm happy to be wrong but i don't think it's a big issue through the ice because we're not moving boats around which have a bilge and have all those plants floating around in them so that's my they may have been uh, speaking also to uh, exotic species in the form of bait fish or something oh. else yeah, well, that's a good point, right, too. I didn't think of that. We have to be kind mm -hmm. of ourselves. Uh, fortunately, in Vermont, the, the uh, bait fish rules that we have uh, requires uh, bait dealers to, you know, be on the lookout. They have to go through inspections from the state regularly. Uh, the bait fish coming into Vermont has to be certified. Uh, so we have a very good handle on that. I would like to add off of that, Roy, that as an example, if people are familiar with Lake Champlain, that the alewife is actually a really good example of an imported bait fish gone wrong. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm not sure if people know, but alewives have been semi detrimental to the you know the Lake Champlain fisheries. Um, you know the effect that you, the nutrients in the water and certain fish species have. Uh, nutrient deficiencies, uh, which cause low survival and early mortality syndrome uh, in very young uh, sack rifles have just hatched. Um, but alewives were actually, and uh, someone decided to import them, and they're an invasive species technically. Great. Thank, thank you for that, Paige. Uh, Christopher Nelson writes, I live in southwestern New Hampshire and I'm new to the area. What are some of the good areas for fishing? He's in Oops. <laughs> What's that, Roy? Gave me a warning here, so I better plug in. Um, okay. That one? 
It's a, it's an adventure tonight. Nothing like con internet connectivity in Vermont. Um, or the lack thereof. Clay. Yeah, or lack thereof. Exactly. Clay, do you know about southwestern New Hampshire I, water bodies? I do know a little bit, but you know, rather than tell you where the best place to fish is, any any body of water in your area is going to be a great place to fish. Be careful on the river. You know, if you do the river, find a setback, make sure you check the, freak, the ice frequently. But any small pond in your area is going to be a fine place to uh, to fish. Um, just get out in the water and experiment, spend some time in the water and then find other people who are fishing, go with them. Um, but I mean, that's, that question is like the classic, where's the best place to catch a fish? And uh, it, it's impossible to tell you that answer, but go where other, pe other people are fishing and start there and, and build out. And there's, there's lots, go to your local bait shop, the smaller, the bait shop, the independent owned shops, they're going to be the best people to help you out as well. So that's my great. Favorite. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ellen Nuffer asks, are there restrictions or concerns on fish safety for consumption in the winter as there may be in the summer? Anyone jump in? Can't quote exactly, but there is a guide that Vermont puts out. Uh, again, you could probably find that on the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website. Um, for the most part, fish are safe to eat. Uh, unless you are a woman who's pregnant, I think that's where you really have to pay attention. Um, and, and, but there, there are there are a few warnings for different bodies of water. Uh, as far as I know, everything down here is safe to eat. Um, again, unless you are a pregnant woman, then you might want to like stay away from walleye. I think that's about the only one. Yellow perch, bluegill, uh, crappie, largemouth bass. Uh, there. Are, to my knowledge, there's no advisories on any of those species. But again, you know, if you were concerned about it, go to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website and the information is there. I think the concern is mercury in fish and that comes from acid rain. It's not spe specific to a different a breed of fish or a species of fish. It gets into all of them. So if you're in New Hampshire, for example, they recommend uh, for women uh, who are of childbearing age, I think it's no more than five ounces per month and for men, no more than five ounces per week somewhere in that area. And then you, you'll find that mercury aggregates in fish. So if you want to eat less mercury, eat smaller fish because that aggregates over time. You can't cook it out. It's in the meat of the fish. So don't eat the monsters, eat the smaller ones. Like Roy was talking earlier about eating smaller bluegills. That's the way to go, I think. Cool. Do you all have favorite, uh, your favorite fish for eating? That you catch? Yellow birch. Yellow perch? Yellow perch, tastiest, the, probably the tastiest fish that you can get through the ice and one of the harder fighting ones, believe it or not. Mm. Uh, the perch seem to be kind of revved up in the wintertime. They fight harder through the ice than they do in open water. Mm. And you get mm. a whole bunch of them too. I like, I like white perch myself, uh, but yellow perch are also delicious. So. Excellent. I would agree. I'm a white perch. White perch, Paige? Absolutely. Uh huh. Rich, you have a preference? Um, any fish I can catch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rich, you make Grateful a good point. They all taste like fish. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have one more question here. It's from Eric Hoffner, and I just want, I'm, I'm so pleased that Eric has tuned in. And I, I uh, just want to say that. We're, we're very fortunate right now at the Brattleboro Museum to have a real terrific exhibit up of Eric's incredible photographs of frozen over ice fishing holes the, the morning after they, you know, they've refrozen. And it's ju just remarkable. Um, so Eric has written in a question here. He says, on lakes here in Western Mass, I see a lot of families out ice fishing. I think that's a good thing since we know kids raised on hunting and fishing develop a lifelong conservation ethic. Do the panelists see many kids and families on the ice? Has that been on the increase there too? I can say, can I can say as, a, as a guide here in the Mount Washington Valley of New Hampshire, this is where a ski town and, and it seems like the pandemic has not keep tourists away, but they're, uh, they're coming up for ski vacations as families in large groups and they're skiing and then they're taking a day to go ice fishing. I'm seeing lots of small children on the ice, lots of multi-age families, multi-generational families coming out. Uh, and fishing, um, and I think ice fishing has always been kind of a family sport. My kids have been doing it since they were born, and 
I think Roy, Roy said his whole family for generations have been doing it. So it's all good. We mm-hmm. love seeing kids on the ice. It's fun. And the flag pops. The magic happens. Nice. Roy, I, I, I thought I heard a little in what you were saying earlier that um, it, maybe I was misinterpreting, but it sounded like maybe your kids aren't as into it as you, as you are, or as your dad or your grandfather. What, how's that looking from your standpoint? Well, my kids are in a little different than I am. Uh, they're kind of scattered about. Uh, both of them are in the military for, for two tours and uh, mm-hmm. college and, uh, you know, trying to start careers. Haven't really, they haven't really, uh, you know, settled down in any one particular place for all that long. Uh, my youngest boy lives out in Missoula, Montana. And um, but believe it or not, they don't get a lot of ice out there, uh, which is kind of shocking. Um, and then, uh, my youngest or my oldest son is down here in Massachusetts and, um, he's been kind of busy starting a family, um, uh, putting food on the table, things of that nature. But, uh, he does love to get out and believe me as kids, they loved going and I loved having them. Yeah. Well, that sounds like regular time of life stuff. Yep. Uh, I mean, outside of, um, and so more broadly, Roy, in response to Eric's question, do you see kids and families um, yeah, taking part in general? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's kind of nice to see. It's kind of been a, a little bit of a rebirth in that in that respect. Uh, for, a, for a long time, you didn't see much of that. It was kind of sad. But um, as of late, say maybe the last four or five years, I've been seeing a lot more, more uh, moms, dads, and kids out ice fishing nice and you know it's it's so kids of of a young age can go and do it by themselves Uh, i was fishing Mm -hmm. by when i was eight nine ten years old so um but it it is good to see it as as a family sure as a a sidebar to that as a sidebar to that piece of advice to parents taking small kids out fishing uh, and this is kind mm-hmm. of more towards this is more towards dads. Um, bring snacks for the kids that your wife doesn't approve on of, and you'll have more fun on the ice. So <laughs> junk food really makes a big difference while you're out there. A little sidebar advice. <laughs> a good tip. I wonder if that tip is on the Vermont Fish and Wildlife website. It should be. <laughs> um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. I, I'm not seeing any more uh, questions or raised hands or anything right now. I, uh, Paige, Rich, Roy, Clay, thank you so much for sharing your experience and expertise and, and maybe more importantly, your enthusiasm with all of us tonight. This has been really great. It's got, the, the, it's got my juices flowing. Um, maybe I'll get out there and, uh, and give it a shot at some point. And maybe Rich, you and I can... I was going to say put a toe in the water, but I, but we don't actually want to put a toe in the water. But maybe you and I can get out there on the ice together at, at some point. Well, you know, um, I'll be a to you and Rich. You have my contact number, so get a hold of me and we'll do something. Thank you, Roy. Really appreciate that. Um, so thank you to all of you. And Paige, thank you especially for hanging in there with the Dicey Connection tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, Before we totally sign off, I just want to let everyone know that a recording of this conversation tonight is going to be available on the museum's website within the next day or two. That's brattleboromuseum.org. And while you're there on on our website, you can also check out the recordings of the previous events we've done around ice fishing. And you can take an online tour of the two photography exhibits I mentioned earlier. Ice Visions by Eric Hosner and Ice Shanties, Fishing, People, and Culture, which was organized by the Vermont Folklife Center and features photographs by Federico Pardo and interviews conducted by Ned Castle with a number of Brattleboro ice fishers, including Roy Gangloff, um, whose shanty appears on a beautiful photograph in the, in the museum right now. Uh, But better yet, better than checking out the uh, online tour, if you're in the Brattleboro area between now and March 6th, stop into the museum and see the exhibits in person. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to 4. Um, 
social distancing is not generally a problem at the museum and we're taking all kind of all the necessary safety uh, precautions. So we'd love to see you there in person. And it's really something to see, the, see those beautiful pictures in person as opposed to online. Last thing I want to mention, if you enjoyed this event tonight and um, would consider making a donation to support this type of free programming, we at the museum would be very grateful for that. That's something you can do on our website, brattleboromuseum.org. Any, any little bit makes a big difference, and I thank you in advance, and I, I of course, understand if that's not possible. I think that does it. Um, stay safe, everyone. Take good care of yourselves and each other, and uh, hope to see you in real life sometime soon. Thank you. Good night. Hey,